All right, so now we're going to dig into these memory constraints. What are these memory constraints that affect incremental language processing? And we're going to develop an information theoretic model of those memory constraints, which is going to explain these dependency locality effects we saw in the last section, and it's going to predict new kinds of effects in language processing and in word order under a heading that we call information locality. So let's get to it. We're going to start, we're going to build from an existing information theoretic model of language processing called surprisal. So surprisal theory holds that the processing difficulty that you experience as a comprehender per word, which is measured as something like the reading time per word, is predicted by the surprisal of that word in its context up to proportionality. So the complexity of understanding a word w given some context is given by the negative log probability of that word given the context. And that negative log probability is what's called surprisal. This is now empirically quite well supported. You get a very good linear relationship between surprisal and reading times if you look in large corpora of reading times. And this theory can also explain certain very characteristic effects that have been studied in psycholinguistics. For example, a lot of garden path effects can be explained simply using this formula, using surprisal. You can think of the surprisal as the information content of the word measured in bits when the logarithm is taken to base two. So essentially a word that has more information in context is going to be slower to process. It engenders more difficulty because it has more information in it. Now, both surprisal and dependency locality contribute to processing difficulty as measured in things like reading times. Surprisal on its own does not account for these dependency locality effects, which I was talking about earlier, because remember those dependency locality effects depend on memory. And there's nothing here in surprisal about memory. Surprisal is about expectation. It's about how much you predict the upcoming words. It's forward looking. Dependency locality is based on memory. It's backwards looking. It's about how you retrieve information about the past. So what I'm going to be doing now is developing a unified model for surprisal and dependency locality, incorporating memory restrictions, memory constraints into a surprisal model in a way that accounts for both surprisal effects, dependency locality effects, and some of the interesting interactions between those things. So let's think about what surprisal theory is really saying, and I'm going to visualize the sort of information theoretic interpretation of this stuff. So let's think about the surprisal and the potential processing difficulty associated with the word out in a context like Bob threw out. So the information content of out as quantified by its surprisal, you can think of that just as this amorphous blob of information represented as zeros and ones here. So you can think about this as just any representation of the meaning and the syntax of this word out. So what is that information? How is it represented? Well, you could think about that as, you know, in terms of like feature attribute value matrices, you could think about it in terms of maybe something pictographic or symbolic. You could think about this as a pattern of activation in a neural network. The key thing is that when we use surprisal, when we use information theory, we don't actually have to worry about the representation. All that matters is not how this is represented. All that matters is how much information there is. Another way of saying that is that if you take whatever representation you like and rewrite it in a minimal way in terms of binary features, how many features does it take? That's how many bits of information are in that representation. So the quantity of information in this word out is going to be given by simply the negative log probability base two of the word out. That's the information content in a representation independent way of this word out. But remember, su remember surprisal is about your processing difficulty in context. And this is just the information content of the word out without considering its context. When you consider the information content in context, which is going to be your surprisal, um, that's going to be given by the log probability of out given the context 
bob through. And you can think about that as taking the information content of out in bits, and then some of those bits are predicted by the context. The blue bits here were predicted by the context. And your processing difficulty is simply the remaining bits. It's the number of bits in the information of the word out which were not predictable given the context. So the yellow bits here become your processing difficulty. The unpredictable bits are hard to process. Okay, so that's a pictographic idea for surprisal theory. Now we're going to generalize this to take into account memory. So surprisal theory says the processing complexity for word and context is just the surprisal of the word given the context. So if you have a context like Bob through the old trash that has been sitting in the kitchen and you're wondering about the difficulty at the word out, it's just going to be the probability of that word out given the context. You're predicting the next word from the context. That's plain surprisal theory. But now we're going to have to generalize it. Because this picture, as I've written it here, can't entirely be true. Why can't it entirely be true? Well, because you don't actually have access to the true context that's predicting the next word. As a comprehender, you don't actually know the context. All you know is your memory representation of the context. So actually, there is a true objective context. Bob through the old trash has been sitting in the kitchen, but what you as a comprehender have is not the objective context. You have a memory representation. And what you're trying to do is predict the next word given the memory representation, not given the objective context. And that memory representation might be lossy. You might have lost information. You might have forgotten the particular words that were used in the context. It might even be more lossy for words that are farther back in the context. So in lossy context surprisal, we say the co process and complexity for a word in context is given by the surprisal of the word given a memory representation of the context, generalizing plain surprisal theory. So let's think about this again in terms of these blobs. You have your processing difficulty is the number of unpredictable bits in yellow there. And the blue things are bits that are predictable from context, so you don't need to worry about them. But now remember, you don't have the real context as a comprehender. You have your memory of the context. And in your memory, that's going to contain some subset of the blue bits. So there's going to be stuff that you remember about the context, which helps you predict the next word. But there's going to be stuff that you did not remember. And so you're not going to be able to predict those bits in the word. And that is going to get converted into excess cost. The surprisal of words given memory representations on average is going to be higher than the surprisal of words given the actual context of those words. So the stuff, the, the predictive information that was in the context but not in your memory gets converted into excess cost. And in fact, you can write the lossy context surprisal as just the surprisal of a word plus this excess cost term which tells you how much extra cost you have because of the lossiness or the noisiness of your memory. Now if this is a bit too informal for you, uh, you can actually convert this into very real terms in information theory. So H here is entropy, which is average surprisal. This says the average surprisal of a word given a memory representation is just the entropy of the word given the context plus this excess cost, which comes out to be a mutual information term. It's the mutual information of the word in the context conditional on the memory. Now, let's think about our paradigm example for dependency locality. Bob through the old trash that had been sitting in the kitchen out. We think that really the key word for predicting that word out was the main verb through here. So the word through is really the thing that makes the word out predictable in context. And here it's really far from the word out. Now let's imagine you're trying to predict the word out, not given the objective context, but given a noisy memory representation of the context. And in particular, we will assume, as an assumption, um, that the memory representations actually lose information at a constant rate per unit time. So these memory representations are increasingly lossy as you go back in time. So your lossy memory representation is something like this. You might not really remember that word through, and now when it comes time to predict the word out, you're in trouble, and it's extra surprising. On the other hand, if the word through is close, 
it's less likely to be affected by this noise. It's more likely to be available in your memory. It's gonna make the word out super predictable and not hard to understand. Lossy context surprisal under this assumption is going to increase whenever words that predict each other are far from each other in linear order. And that's information locality. Uh, more technically, you could say that the processing difficulty is uh, predicted to increase whenever words that have high mutual information are distant from each other. And more mathematically, you can show this in this way. So we showed last time that the uh, lossy conic surprisal is just surprisal plus this excess memory cost. That memory cost can be approximated in this way. So, so this is a scary uh, formula, but it's not so bad. What this says is the memory cost here is a sum over all the pairs of words in an utterance of two things. There's this F, J minus I. This is the proportion of information which is lost for a word which is J minus I time steps in the back. This is monotonically increasing by assumption. So you're losing more information for words that are farther back in the past. You multiply that with the pointwise mutual information of the two words wi and wj that you are considering. So this thing is going to be high when you have words that have high PMI that are separated from each other by large distances. And it's going to be low when the things that have high PMI are close to each other. So that's information locality. I've been claiming, though, that this is going to recover dependency locality. Let's see if that's really true. Let's see the conditions under which that's true. What is so let's put the two generalizations next to each other. Dependency locality says there's difficulty when words and dependencies are far from each other. Information locality says that difficulty happens when words that predict each other are far from each other. So information locality will reduce to dependency locality if syntactic dependencies just identify those word pairs with high mutual information. We can do this a little more formally. So dependency locality just says that you take a sum over all the word pairs in a sentence, and you take the distance between them, j minus i, take some monotonically increasing function of the distance, and you multiply by this thing in brackets here, which says it's going to be 1 if those words are in a dependency and 0 otherwise. It's called an Iverson bracket. That's dependency locality, one formalization of it. Information locality comes from an approximation to lossy context surprisal, which looks like this. You just have a monotonically increasing function of the distance, that's f, multiplied by the PMI. If the PMI basically approximates the Iverson bracket, if it approximates parsing, then we have information locality reducing to dependency locality. So I've argued that this processing theory predicts that words that predict each other should be close to each other to avoid processing difficulty. That was derived from a theory of processing difficulty that incorporates effects of memory and probabilistic expectations. And you can check out these papers for evidence that this also captures a number of other psycholinguistic phenomena. And I've argued that dependency locality is actually sort of subsumed into information locality. And in the next section, I'm going to be presenting evidence substantiating this claim and also claims of information locality beyond dependency locality.